for coming along. We have a really interesting mix of the general public and university students here. My name is Bronwyn Morgan, um, and um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome tonight Janelle Orsi, um, who's here in Bristol for this week as a Benjamin Meeker Visiting Fellow. That's a program that the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Bristol has for bringing fascinating forward thinkers from all over the world to stay with us for short and long term. And um, Janelle has a, um, she's a, one of the innovative forward thinkers coming from outside the academy, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of her background in a minute. I just wanted to thank the, the, the Institute of Advanced Studies for sponsoring her visit, as well as um, the Cabot Institute, um, which is the Environmental Research Institute based at the University of Bristol Cross Faculty, which helped with the costs, and also the University of New South Wales, Australia, where I'm currently based as a research fellow, um, but my research involves um, fieldwork in Bristol too, so I'm pleased to be back here um, for research activities in, con in the context of that project which Janelle is contributing to as well. But tonight's a public lecture on her general work. Um, she is, as I said, not based in the academy, but she's doing a lot of really um, forward conceptual rethinking of how we can, inter how we can reframe our sense of how law interacts with the economy. She herself is actually a practicing lawyer, um, focusing on sharing economy law, which is more or less a field she kind of invented, as far as I can tell, since 2008. Um, her book, Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy, has the subtitle, Helping People Build Cooperatives, Social Enterprise, and Local Sustainable Economies. And these days, you could be forgiven for being surprised by that, given the, the Silicon Valley um, style of the sharing economy debates going on in the press, but you'll get a different perspective from Janelle tonight. She also has an earlier book called The Sharing Solution from Nolo Press, which is a practical and legal guide to cooperating and sharing resources of all kinds. And last year, she was elected by the Ashoka Foundation to be one of their fellows, joining a robust cohort of social entrepreneurs who are recognized to have innovative solutions to social problems and the potential to change patterns across society. And in 2010, the American Bar Association profiled her as a legal rebel, um, an attorney who's remaking the legal profession through the power of innovation. I have to say, she's probably the only um, legal rebel who's applied for legal insurance to practice securities law um, uh, in the United States. I don't know if you'll touch on that, but um, she's going to speak to you tonight on the topic of a cartoon guide to designing organizations, navigating laws, and building resilient communities. She'll speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. And um, thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let me know if the audio is okay because I'm probably going to talk loud. All right. So I'm also a cartoonist. Uh, the reason is that I get very optimistic when I think about the future, and then I just want to impart that to people. Uh, and the only way I can think of to do so is to draw cartoons about it. So here are my cartoons. I also try to break down legal concepts into simple, digestible forms. So that's the other reason I draw cartoons. So um, let's see. Oh, there we go. So about the legal system, about the economic system, I've drawn a, a grain mill to kind of illustrate how it works currently. And uh, so let's imagine you want to make bread. And this is how our legal and economic system tends to make bread. We have all these inputs like land and water and seeds. Uh, we have workers who put in their, their labor. We have consumers who put in their money. Uh, we sprinkle on a little bit of pesticides. And then we have these companies that are basically, they're elected by their share, but the boards are elected by their shareholders. And they are basically behind the wheel driving this company in order to earn money for themselves. And over time, these companies are structured so that the companies earn money, they get more and more power as they grow. And we haven't questioned this structure very much over the last hundred years or so because it's been giving us something that we sort of need, which is food and jobs. And so we've kind of been working in this system without questioning it enough. And we did, though, start to question it in some ways. And so in the US legal system, and I know this is also true here, we started to realize, well, if, if we allow these economic relationships to operate like this without uh, in, in putting in a few regulations, then people will kind of be exploited. So workers would be exploited. They might not have good working conditions. They might work long hours. 
And so in our legal system, and in most legal systems, we started to just tighten some screws in the system. We thought, well, we can't just let it exploit endlessly. We need to tighten up and create employment laws so that workers can get a minimum wage and have fair working conditions. We created securities laws so that people who put their money, they invest their money into these enterprises won't just completely lose their investment. I think it's also called financial offerings and financial advertising law here. It's called something different in every country, but yeah, in the U.S. we call it securities laws. So making sure people jump through a lot of legal hoops before they take your money, basically. Uh, we created all these health and safety laws, consumer protection laws, so that we don't poison people uh, and harm them in other ways. And we created zoning laws so that big companies don't just move into our neighborhoods and create a lot of noise and nuisance and pollution. And so it's important to note that even though we've tightened all the screws in this system over time, and we keep tightening and tightening them, it hasn't necessarily protected us very well. So that's me about 14 years ago. I used to work for Darden Restaurants, which is actually the biggest restaurant chain in the whole world. It's, it's a full service, you sit down and you order off a menu kind of restaurant chain. So they have a lot of profits. They have half a billion dollar and half a million dollars per year in surplus profits, but they still don't pay sick time for their workers. The minimum wage in the U.S. for our tipped employees is still $2.13 an hour. So that's what I used to make, and sometimes I just really didn't make very much at all. So the laws aren't necessarily protecting us. So um, they're also causing this. They're causing wealth to just continually flow in one direction. And, the, and so this is in the U.S. This is the the uh, wealth gap in the United States, where 20% of people control 93% of the wealth. And that just means that the other 80% of us basically are working with 7%. And it's, and it's, you know, it just keeps going and going and going that way. We haven't quite reversed that very well yet. So, so a lot of people think, okay, well, forget that whole system. It's not serving us. It's not protecting us. It's just creating wealth inequality. Let's start creating new systems. And so, we have people at the grassroots level organizing things like this, worker cooperatives, and food cooperatives, local currencies, car sharing groups, basically strategies for meeting our needs outside of that exploitative system. But this is what happens when we try to operate within that legal system. So we're creating a new economic system in a way from the grassroots, but we're still operating in the, the primary legal system. So let's imagine a group of people starts a food cooperative. Uh, in the U.S., we have a lot of communities where you don't even have access to a grocery store or a place to buy fresh food. There are maybe liquor stores or little convenience markets, but no place to necessarily buy healthy food. So people form food cooperatives. They start purchasing food together. They aggregate their buying power, and they choose to support certain farmers or certain food producers. And maybe they use somebody's garage as a space to bring in all these orders, they might get some shelves and organize the food onto shelves. They might each put in, say, $500 to start the uh, cooperative. They might each volunteer their time every month. Uh, but look what happens when they try to comply with the laws and basically operate their business. There it is. See, they, they can't turn the wheel. See that? <laughs> it's stuck. And the reason is because we put all of these bolts in the system. We've just tightened and tightened them all over time. And so, um, just to give you an example of how the laws come up as a barrier, um, employment laws might be a barrier for that group because um, they're not just people who are grocery shopping. Grocery shopping is something we all do, and there aren't many barriers to doing that. They're not operating a grocery store, which is something you kind of you know, in the commercial realm, that's a very formal activity and you need to comply with a lot of laws to start a grocery store. There, there's something in between. But if they're a grocery store, they couldn't be volunteering their time. Because as a general rule, if a business is going to be using your labor, they need to pay you a minimum wage and make sure you have uh, certain protections as a worker. So there they are, right in between. They've formed a, you can call it a large buying club, you can call it a small food cooperative, and they've each agreed to volunteer a few hours per month. They might actually be, be violating employment laws. And in the US, a number of food cooperatives have already been shut down because of this. So, okay. Um, this also just brings up a huge inherent tension in everything in the so-called sharing economy or new economy, which is that a lot of it's happening here. 
It's a lot of people who are trying to meet their needs for food, for housing, for energy, transportation. They start to get organized about it, and they start to grow groups to do it. And so as they become more formalized, they move toward this commercial realm. So a lot of what is happening in the new economy is happening in this, this green area, or, or legal gray area. So, okay, another area of law that this food cooperative is violating is securities laws or financial offerings laws, because maybe they, and maybe they put up a sign that said, join our food cooperative, invest $500, or uh, buy a membership share for $500. So, as far as how people can use their money legally, people can go buy cat food, for example, without many barriers. People can also buy stock in large companies, that, um, and the reason for that is because these large companies have done a lot of work. They've created disclosures and they've gotten approval from securities regulators to create this opportunity to invest. But if a bunch of people got together and they're each putting in money to start their natural cat food cooperative, let's say, on one hand you could say they're just getting together to buy cat food together. On another hand you could say, well actually they're all investing in their own cat food company together. But either way, they're in that gray area again. and they might be violating securities laws. Okay, another area of law. Uh, consumer protection laws, health and safety laws. This comes up because, you know, in a grocery store, generally you have a lot of rules to make sure that the place is clean, safe. Uh, in the U.S., you generally need to have five different kinds of sinks. You need to have a sink for your mop, sink to wash hands, sink to wash vegetables. You need to have washable floors, washable walls, all of these things. So if you're operating in someone's garage, or just any other space that you can get cheaply, you probably can't comply with that. And so here again, this buying club is right in that gray area again, and it's not clear if they need to comply with these laws. In fact, I was part of a food cooperative that got, didn't get shut down, but because we weren't able to comply with this, we eventually realized we couldn't afford to stay in business. So uh, just another example of how consumer protection and safety laws are creating a barrier to interesting wonderful economic activities and communities is that seed libraries are now being shut down across the United States. We have 400 seed libraries, which are they're places you can go and get free seeds of all varieties. You can plant them, grow your own food, and if you want, you can harvest the seeds later, come back and donate them to the seed library so other people can come and enjoy those seeds. Well, they're being shut down because the idea is the law says you have to have, you have to label every seed with certain information. You have to s submit all seeds for testing procedures. Uh, and the goal is to protect people who buy seeds to make sure they're actually buying what they think they're buying. And these are good laws if you're, say, a farmer and you want to make sure you're buying good seed. But if you're just a community member who wants some free seeds, it's kind of ridiculous. So, um, so yeah, this is actually something we're working on currently in the U.S. is trying to change the laws in all 50 states around access to seeds. So, um, okay, one more area of law, just to talk about how it comes up as a barrier: zoning laws, land use laws. The way that uh, in a lot of places in the world we tend to manage land is to divide it up into these these kind of boxes. We have places where we live. We have residential zones uh, where we basically go and we sleep and we live and we do our sort of everyday things, but we don't work there, we don't shop there. We go to commercial zones to do our shopping. We might go to industrial zones if we work in manufacturing. Uh, and we go to agricultural zones if we're growing food and engaging in large-scale agriculture. But by dividing our lives into these little boxes of residential, commercial, agricultural, uh, industrial, we've made it kind of impossible to relocalize production, relocalize food growing, we localize our transactions with each other. So here again you have a lot of people do this now. They grow their own food. They're not operating farms in their backyard, but they might start to get very enthusiastic about it. And then they grow all of these vegetables and then they think, well, you know, I'm underemployed, maybe I can make a little extra income by selling these vegetables. So people try to do this and then the city comes and says, sorry, that's illegal, you're in a residential zone, you're operating a commercial and agricultural activity. So, okay, I mean, the sum total of it is, is that we have a lot of legal hoops to jump through. And these, these legal hoops are good. All of these laws are very good in the sense they are designed to protect us, but they're also designed uh, to be complied with only if you have a lot of money. 
So if you have a lot of money, you can get through them, and everybody else just kind of looks at them and doesn't know what to do. And this has gotten us to a point where if we want to start creating new economies and take back uh, our livelihoods, we can't really use our own money. We can't invest our own money in that. We can't really use our time, our labor. Uh, we can't use our relationships. We can't um, collaborate with one another. And we can't use our homes and neighborhoods. So if you kind of think about it, we, we don't really have anything to work with. The law has basically prevented us from using any of these things, which we would actually need to rebuild an economy. So my organization uh, has started to grapple with this. And one of the ways that we grapple with it is to basically bring the legal hoops back down to earth, lower the legal barriers, so that people can get through them. And I actually think there are so many laws to change all over the world at the local levels, state levels, federal levels. And in that case, I actually think everybody should start to think of themselves as a citizen policy maker. So maybe put it on your lifetime to-do list, change at least one law, because there are just a lot that we have to change. Uh, and I, I made that slide just to demonstrate that it's a lot of fun to change laws. But, um, an example of ways that we've changed laws, we've been involved in crowdfunding laws, basically laws that make it easier to take, to raise money for a business and take small investments or micro loans from community members. Uh, we've been involved in cottage food laws, which are the laws that let you make certain foods at home and then sell them in the community. So using your home kitchen, you can now, uh, in a lot of states in the United States, bake bread. Because you never hear about people getting food poisoning from bread. Bread is a pretty safe food item. So jam, dried fruit, other foods that generally are pretty safe. So we're lowering a lot of barriers. We're basically carving out exemptions for small-scale activities. There's our website, by the way. I put it up just so you know, it's a very colorful, unusual website with squirrels with megaphones and things. So hopefully you'll visit it and check out what we do. But these are some of the laws we just passed last year related to alternative currencies, housing cooperatives, uh, neighborhood food growing. Uh, but there's also this problem that we kept running up against, which is, okay, all of these regulations, they were created to protect us. We can't just keep loosening them for every little thing that we can think of. Because it could open floodgates to extraction, especially in realms like employment laws where workers are very vulnerable, or securities laws where our investments can be very vulnerable. So then, um, and we especially can't loosen them for businesses like this, because even when they have a lot of resources, they don't invest them to protect people. So, finally realized, the answer is that we just need to change the economic system that we're operating in. And it's the economic system that's flawed, and we only really need to change two things about it. One is who's in control, and the other is who gets the money. So if we only change those two little things, we could actually begin to change the laws. So um, let's see what happens with this particular bread company. Okay, there's a bread company now where the board of directors, it's not elected by the shareholders, it's elected by the workers, the bakers themselves. So by definition, this company is going to be driven or steered in the direction that will benefit the workers. Also, let me see if this works. I just made this today, these things. Um, the profits, okay, where does the money go? The profits are going to be distributed to the workers on the basis of the value or quantity of the work they do. A lot of worker cooperatives just measure it by the number of hours. So if this worker worked 2,000 hours in the year and this one only worked 1,000 hours, this person's going to get twice the dividend at the end of the year. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a worker cooperative. And the thing about the word cooperative, though, I just have to stop and say one thing, is in a lot of places, the word cooperative has a lot of baggage. People tend to think, oh, cooperatives. Cooperatives are places where they're always having really long, frustrating, boring meetings. And they're kind of slow, and they don't get a lot done. So. I wanted to boil cooperatives down to a very simple legal concept, which is the first thing is that money doesn't buy power in a cooperative because decisions are made on a one-member, one-vote basis. So in that worker cooperative, each worker gets one vote in the election of the board. Uh, it doesn't mean they're involved in every decision, but at the end of the day, because they elect that board, they have the power to organize in their interests. And money doesn't buy profits. 
So your ability, your privilege, the money that you have to invest in a business is not what's going to determine your ability to earn money. It's actually the work that you do. It's the contribution that you make uh, in labor or other forms. So that's the sort of basics of cooperatives. And if you just boil it down to those two things and try to shed some of the misconceptions about cooperatives, I think that's very important to do. So, um, oh, so a consumer cooperative, of course, is one where the consumers, the customers, elect the board of directors. Again, on one member, one vote basis. But what you do with the profits at the end of the year is a little bit different. You distribute them on, on the basis of uh, the quantity or the value of the purchases people made. So if one person uh, bought twice as much food, they would get twice the dividend at the end of the year. Um, and the thing about cooperatives is they don't keep cranking wealth in that direction. They turn wealth around and they basically cycle and recycle it in our communities. And as you cycle and recycle wealth, it, it grows that share of wealth here in the 80%. So, um, so just to compare and contrast, so I talked about this extractive economic system that's basically designed to take as much as it possibly can. And here's one that's designed to basically provide for its members, to protect its members, to nourish its members, and it has disincentives to exploit them. Uh, and it cycles and recycles the wealth. So you can call that a generative system. So that is our legal wedge. When you compare and contrast, we have one system that's designed to extract, and we have one legal structure that's designed to generate. And another word, I, oh, sorry, and that's also the place, if you can, if you have systems that are designed to generate, legal structures that are designed to generate, then that's when you can begin to loosen some of the bolts. You don't loosen them for these extractive entities. You can loosen them for cooperatives. So for example, this consumer cooperative maybe doesn't need to have five kinds of sinks because they're the ones who are running the grocery store. They're also the ones running it, so maybe they don't need to comply with securities laws before they put their money in and so on. Um, so one moral to the story is cooperatives just to emphasize it, uh, it's because we can't, we can't change the economy without them, but we also can't change the legal system without them. We've sort of painted ourselves into a corner with our legal system. And I think the only way to get out is to build legal structures that provide for us. And another way of saying it is we are we're creating commons. I've started to use this word commons more. And I started to really like the word commons after I read this book. And, um, and the way that David Bollier, the author, describes a commons is he says that a commons can arise anytime a group of people comes together and decides they're going to manage a certain resource with the goal of equitable access uh, and to create or to ensure long-term stewardship. So I'm going to describe just a few other examples of commons because it's not just cooperatives. There are other legal structures that are designed that can be designed to do this. Uh, Nonprofits. So a nonprofit, by definition, takes the earnings of the entity and reinvests them into the entity. So the wealth cycles and cycles around in the nonprofit. It doesn't get distributed out to anybody. Uh, and then you have a board of directors. Although different types of nonprofits, the board is elected in different ways. So uh, let's imagine you're trying to create, you're creating an organization to create access to agricultural land. So. Uh, you call it an agricultural land trust. And uh, generally, land trusts, at least in the United States, are nonprofit organizations. And uh, well, here's the thing about nonprofits nonprofits also kind of have a bad reputation. At least where I'm from, people are always saying, oh, nonprofits, you know, they're these big, clunky organizations. This is what people think of a lot of times when they think of nonprofits. And, you know, they're slow. There's all this, you know, bureaucracy and nonprofits, but again, like nonprofits don't have to be that. And there's a lot of room for creativity in how we design nonprofits because they're a really powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing to have a container from which to do something where you're not distributing out dividends. So, um, so we can get creative in how we design the governance. And um, community community land trusts are an example. Generally, community land trusts in the United States are formed to create affordable housing and to preserve the housing as affordable in the long term. And so in order to represent the interests of the community, they have 
commu just community members at large elect a couple seats on the board. They have the residents of the land, they give them a voice by allowing them to uh, elect a couple of the seats or a third of the seats. And then a lot of times a third of the seats are appointed by the board members in order to represent special skills or expertise. But we can keep getting creative with this kind of thing. If you're creating a land trust to benefit farmers and to ensure long-term access to ag agricultural land for everyone, and this is because I'm involved in creating an agricultural land trust right now. So these are some of the ideas that we're thinking of, is we want the residents of the land, the farmers, to have a voice. We also want the farm workers to have a voice, because 70% of farm workers in the United States can't vote in regular, regular elections because they're not citizens. So, great, 70% of the people producing our food don't have a voice. So, we want to give them a voice. And um, we want organizations that help develop farms, like nonprofits, to have a voice. Um, we want the people who buy the food, who make the choice to subscribe to the farmer's harvest through a CSA. Do you call it a CSA here? Community Supported Agriculture Program. We want them to have a voice, and so we're, we're designing this with the goal that it will, the board will make decisions in a matter of people's interests. But, and we're also using some of the principles of Eleanor Ostrom, she got the Nobel Prize in Economics, and she, she looked at commons around the world and, and asked the question of, well, what, what structures are uh, most stable, what are the, the ways in which people have managed commons for long-term stewardship, and she found these principles, she said, Across the board, these are some of the things that I see in the design of commons around the world for management of land, for management of fisheries. So uh, you could just go on Wikipedia and look up Eleanor Ostrom to find these principles. So we thought, well, let's try to embed these in every organization we design. Let's try to embed them in this agricultural land trust. And so one of the things that she says is for larger groups, because we want this land trust to be pretty large, uh, Create multiple layers of nested enterprises. So, and also, what does she say? Uh, have participatory decision making by the people who are actually using the resources. And so, um, she uses big words like subsidiarity, subsidiarity, and polycentricity. Which, since I'm not an academic, I don't usually use those big words. But the idea is that governance should kind of come from below. You should be able to harness the wisdom of, of people from every level of the organization. So you have a board of directors which brings their wisdom. But you also have groups of farmers at the local level who can organize circles and then gain legitimacy by petitioning a higher circle or the board of directors to be a smaller decision-making body. So that's part of what we're creating with this land trust. And um, a quick note also about governance structures, too, it's because um, you know, preferably we won't be writing bylaws that look like this because if you really want to empower people at every level, they need to be able to understand what are the structures in which we're operating and um, how can we use them to, to have a voice. And so, you know, a lot of cooperatives and organizations have taken the opposite approach where they say, you know what, we don't need all of this fancy structure. We don't need these legal documents with all these big words. We're just going to have good relationships and it will all be fine. And, and so what you end up with, though, I realized is because I also, I, I've had a private law practice for the last seven years, more or less. And a lot of my clients are uh, eco-villages, co-housing communities, worker cooperatives. And so it's groups of people who have come together. Uh, and prior to me becoming their lawyer, they might not have had very much structure in how they make decisions. And so what you end up with, um, I call it the tyranny of structuralism. Rex. But there was this um, article written in the 60s or 70s about feminist movements that said, well, you know, a lot of fem feminist groups rejected this idea of having a lot of formal structures because that is, you know, it creates structures of hierarchy. And they said, we don't want hierarchy. Um, but by rejecting structure altogether, uh, hierarchies begin to just form naturally because what you have in organizations are people who basically have a greater sense of entitlement to power. They are maybe louder. They're maybe bossier, and so inequalities begin to form in organizations if you have no structure. So structure is very important. And, uh, and structure comes in the form of creating clear procedures for how you hold meetings, uh, for how decisions are actually proposed, how you make those decisions. 
Uh, what are people's voting rights? What are the compositions of the Also, we put our policies online, and we put most of them, the ones that we've cleaned up enough, uh, so other organizations can uh, try to replicate our model. I'm also very inspired that by this book that I've been reading um, called Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lalo, and you can download it from reinventingorganizations.org. But he looks at organizations around the world that have created just highly functional um, distributed governance systems. He looks at large organizations, even with a thousand or more employees, where they've managed to, to spread governance throughout the organization in very efficient ways. So, so anyways, yeah, just, I was just saying that because, you know, nonprofits, there's a lot of different ways to design them. There's a lot of different ways to ensure that different stakeholders are engaged and that their voices are heard. So, um, so back, I wanted to highlight at least one more form of commons, which is, maybe two. Uh, I'm not really sure what to call it, but David Bollier calls it a stakeholder trust. There's also a guy named Peter Barnes who writes about this. Um, I think he calls it a stakeholder trust also, but basically it's an entity that's designed to recycle some of the wealth, but also pay out dividends to everybody. I'll tell you what anyway, everybody. To basically pay equal dividends. So I've already showed you organizations, cooperatives, basically that pay dividends on the basis of people's work or their purchases. But here's an example of one that pays everybody an equal dividend. And the organization is governed by trustees whose job it is is to make sure that we manage a resource in the long term, not only for present generations, but also future generations. So here's an example of a resource we might want to manage like that, uh, which is the Earth's, well, maybe Earth, but also the Earth's atmosphere um, and our ability to put carbon into it, our ability to pollute it, because basically when a company does that, a lot of companies put carbon in the air for free without paying anything, or they pollute our air for free. But so, one idea that, that Peter Barnes has come up with and other people are saying, hey, we should maybe try this, is to start charging a fee when people put carbon into the air or pollute the air, uh, and then pay that out, sorry, pay those fees out to everybody because we were all born here on this earth. We all have a, a, what is it, a birthright to these resources. And so not, you know, we shouldn't just let one person pollute it because they have the money to do so. If they're going to do so, they're taking away something from the rest of us. So an example of an organization that does this is the Alaska Permanent Fund. So in the U.S., the state of Alaska, which is huge, has a lot of minerals, oil, gas resources. And so the state created this trust, and the trust charges any company a fee if they're going to take minerals out of the ground or extract oil. And they, they raise the fee to kind of disincentivize the extraction, but when they, the money that they earn, they actually distribute every, every year to every person who lives in the state um, as a basic dividend. So in this way, people also get a, a universal basic income. So if they're unemployed, they at least know they're going to get two or three thousand dollars in the form of a dividend check from the, the trust. And one reason, so I was talking about different forms of governance and how, how to represent different stakeholders. In this case, you might want to have trustees that are appointed, appointed and that serve indefinitely. And the reason is, well, one reason is, um, if you have people be elected, then Future generations don't have a voice. Future generations can't say, hey, what about us? Don't use up the whole resource before we're born. Um, so you can't necessarily rely on current, you know, current day individuals to make decisions in the best interest of, of future generations. But also because people do behave differently when they are in elected positions. Part of that is because there's so much money in politics. And that's, that's something that we can work on resolving. But in the meantime, in a lot of situations when you have people get elected, by the time they're there, they've already bought um, you know, some, I mean, they've been bought by so many interest groups that they're not necessarily making decisions for the benefit of everyone. So appointing trustees who have a fiduciary duty to benefit future generations um, and who, are, who know that they're going to be in that position in the long term might do better than elected trustees. So uh, since I haven't mentioned it yet, 
and people often ask about it. I thought I'd mention benefit corporations, B corporations, because Bronwyn also mentioned that. Um, well, you have the community interest corporation here, but also it sounds like uh, people might propose another type of company here, or it's under consideration, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, so it's a, a type of company that it operates like a regular for-profit company on one hand, but it has the ability to put in its charter or its articles of incorporation uh, certain environmental goals, certain social goals. So they're companies that do good things. And so, so that's a nice thing. But the one thing I want to say is that even benefit corporations, even corporations that build certain environmental and social goals, into the design of the organization still have a voice in their head. That voice is the shareholders who elect the board. And those shareholders do want to earn money. And there's kind of this insatiable drive to earn money. Because if you've noticed, there are people who earn millions and millions of billions of dollars. And it's kind of rare for them to stop and say, OK, I've earned enough now. You know, There is kind of this insatiable drive to continue to maximize profits. And so as long as you have that voice in the head of an organization, meaning you have board members who can maximize their profits, then they, um, they're going to be making decisions that do maximize their profits, at least in some ways. They might say, well, let's buy the cheaper grains. Let's not buy the cooperatively produced grains. Maybe we'll cut a few corners, cut health insurance. And so generally, if you're building a commons, you don't want to have that type of voice in a governance role. David Bullier has, he has a lot of quotes from that book that I mentioned, but he just says that if you want to create commons, you need to really resist their enclosure and resist, resist that lust for capital accumulation. So ensure you, you build it in a shell that cannot be permeated by that drive. Um, so I don't know. If, <coughs> is anybody here involved in creating organizations, creating cooperatives, creating, I don't know, farmers markets or things like that? Or, there's a few people in the room. Um, a lot of people would just complain right now. It's, just, it's hard to get anything started right now. If you're trying to start a new food cooperative or renewable energy cooperative, it feels like you're pushing a giant rock up a hill. And that is because that is because of the whole design of our legal and economic system. It's not designed to privilege cooperatives. There's not a lot of literacy about what is a cooperative or what is commons. Um, there are, as I mentioned, legal barriers. There's not necessarily financing opportunities. and so. I do actually think we're going to get to a tipping point, and it's we're going to get there through the convergence of a lot of factors, and those factors do involve removing legal barriers. It's through education, if you're an educator, or just growing literacy about what are these legal structures and what are their impacts, um, building consumer consciousness about these things, creating financing opportunities. There's basically a role for everyone. Uh, yeah, everyone. So we're all kind of just creating the fertile ground for these things. And, and I have hope because I do think we'll get to that tipping point. Um, and if you're kind of an everyday person thinking, well, what is my role? Sometimes I like to break it into four different levels um, of building the sharing economy. There's things that you can do with it at the sort of casual one time, at the level of sort of doing things on a one-time basis, at the casual, spontaneous level. Just coming together with your community to do more, rather than relying on giant companies. So borrowing things, providing childcare to one another, giving people rides. The second level, um, you start to formalize these arrangements a little more. You create agreements to, say, regularly exchange childcare, or to co-own a house, or to um, co-own a car. Example. And by creating agreements, you create economic relationships you can start to rely on. So, um, for example, my neighbor and I share a vacuum cleaner. It's not just that she can borrow my vacuum cleaner whenever she asks. Um, well, she can. Um, it's, it's not that she just sort of occasionally asks, but we actually have an agreement that the vacuum lives at her house, and anytime I need it, actually, I go and get it from her. And so we have an agreement, which means we don't each have to own a vacuum cleaner. Already, that's one agreement we've made that we can rely on to meet our needs. As small as it is, these things make a big difference. Um, at the third level, we build organizations. And this is, this is a lot of what I've been talking about so far, is what is the structure of these organizations. Um, but the great thing about organizations is, unlike the spontaneous things we do with neighbors or these agreements that we create, 
organizations become institutions in our community. So even if we move away, those institutions remain, and that's how you begin to really embed a sharing economy throughout the community. Uh, but there's also a fourth level, which I, I kind of been, have been referring to as universal systems of provision. Basically, systems that are there to provide for everybody, or commons, maybe you want to call it, but you know, universal access to health care, um, public universities, things that pretty much everybody needs and that we can know that we can rely on. Um, so, things and then decide at the end what I was going <laughs> to include, because, you know, I always want to talk about something, but, um, let's see, well, okay, yeah, one question that a lot of people have is, how, all right, we start creating all these new organizations, we create new enterprises to make bread, sell bread, how are these little companies, these small organizations and projects going to compete with that current economic system we have, with large bread companies? Um, so that's where another legal tool comes in. So I've talked a lot about organizations and the legal structure of organizations, but also the agreements that we make, agreements in the form of binding contracts we can rely on, will make a big difference. So here's an example of one. So people nodded their heads when you said you've heard of community-supported agriculture. I guess someone told me it originated here, so that makes sense. Um, but the sort of underlying concept of community-supported agriculture or community-supported enterprises, you're making a relationship with a producer. So even if you don't own the bread company um, or own the farm, you're, in the case of a farm, you're making an agreement with a farmer to basically provide some capitalization for the farm by buying a share of the harvest in advance of the planting season. So that gives farmer the farmer capital to plant and basically pay for everything that's necessary until there's a harvest. You're sharing the profits or the bounty of that because you're getting a percentage of the harvest and if it's a good harvest year, you get to share in that. You're also sharing risk because if it's not such a great year, you're, you're going to take a small hit from that as well. You might share in the work or the labor, of course that brings up employment law issues which I already acknowledged, but a lot of people go out and they volunteer on farms that they've chosen to support. Uh, the farm likely shares more information with the consumers by just being more transparent about how it operates, what it pays its workers, how it spends its money, where it gets its seeds, uh, and finally decision making, where a farmer might actually involve customers in decisions about, well, what is it that you want to buy? What should I actually grow this year? And so basically you have consumers and producers making agreements. So this is not a new type of organization necessarily, it's a form of contract. So they're making contracts to share six different things that we normally don't share so much when we go out to buy bread. And so we can begin to support a lot of businesses like that. Um, and just in the, in the context of bread, let's say you have um, a neighbor who's starting a little bread company out of their own kitchen. You could say, oh, I'm going to support you, I'm going to buy bread from you sometimes. Or you could do something more powerful, which is to get together with a lot of your neighbors and say, we agree we're each going to buy one loaf of bread per week for a year. And then in exchange, you agree to do positive things to benefit us, which is spend part of your earnings in the neighborhood, support local farmers, use healthy grains. And so it's mutually beneficial. And the bread producer knows that he or she is going to have some guaranteed success, at least for the first year. So that is how you know, one small bread producer competes with the larger ones is through agreements. So thinking about the types of agreements we can make, basically coming together and agreeing, no, this is not the economy we want, but this is. And that can be a very powerful thing. So it's also, I think, a very powerful thing in getting finance. If you're a startup business, there's not a lot of access to financial capital to get started. But let's say you have 500 people who said, I'm going to buy one loaf of bread per week. Well, that might actually get you there. So. Um, this, this was one little set of slides I was going to use, but I actually made it into a cartoon and put it on YouTube. It's called The Next Sharing Economy. Um, so hopefully I won't spoil the punchline. Um, but a lot of what that was about is 
uh, creating one, one other kind of cooperative, uh, which I've been calling freelancer-owned cooperatives. And you've all probably you've probably heard of Airbnb. I definitely um, maybe raise your hand if you haven't heard of Airbnb. Usually people do, but usually at least one person raises their hand. But. Okay, so there's Airbnb where people are making money by renting out their homes. There's also Uber. Do you guys have Uber here? Okay, so basically it's an online platform that allows people to pick up strangers and drive them around and earn money. So kind of operating little taxi cab companies. And um, so the ownership of these companies is, it's that extractive system. It's a company that's designed to take a fee from everybody's labor, basically, uh, and generate billions of dollars for these very large companies. So Airbnb and Uber are both valued at more than $10 billion each. So it brings up the question of how do we protect these freelance workers? So the drivers for Uber and the hosts for Airbnb are what some people would call freelancers. Now freelancers is this word that's kind of just coming into more usage, even in the US, but um, it's important because by some studies, at least 34% of people in the, US, in the US are freelancers, meaning they don't work as full-time employees at some place. Maybe they work part-time, but they also do other things. They might work on a contracting basis or have side jobs or a small enterprise or they're temporary workers, uh, or they drive for Uber, or they host for Airbnb. So the fact that they're one third of our workforce means that we should really be thinking about how to serve their interests. And um, so, oops, I missed it. Well, oh, what I was going to say, ignore that slide for one minute. <laughs> Freelancer owned cooperatives. So we just took one of those companies. It's not Airbnb. It's not. Uber, but it's a company, it's an online platform that enables service providers to offer their services uh, and receive payment. And these are people who walk dogs, who do babysitting, who do house cleaning, massage, people who are offering their services to strangers online, getting paid. It's called Loconomics, L-O-C-O-N-O-M-I-C-S, so Loconomics.com. So we restructured it as a cooperative. It's now owned by freelancers. So the freelancers, they elect most of the board, and that means the board is going to be making decisions to benefit them. It's not going to be taking a huge cut of their money. Airbnb and Uber take 15 to 20% of each worker's uh, earnings. And it's also going to be creating tools and creating programs that benefit them. So freelancers need a lot of tools. They might need uh, training opportunities. They might need marketing help. They need website help. And so Loconomics is basically because it's driven by the freelancers, going to be making decisions that enhance their stability as workers. So, so freelancer cooperatives. Oh, one, one little thing about lawyers, very good place. The last thing I'm going to say is, this is what a lot of lawyers do, is they work for that pile of wealth. A lot of lawyers work for the 20% the wealthiest people in society, and that's why lawyers have been able to charge so much money per hour. Most people in the US just think, I can't afford a lawyer, I can't afford a lawyer, because Lawyers have really kept themselves busy, basically serving that sector, sector of society, and so they haven't really come back down to earth to serve this sector of society yet. But I predict, I predict now, so I'll be able to say, I told you so in 10 years, I hope, that I predict that about 100,000 lawyers in the world in the very near future are going to shift their, their focus of their work to serving the creation of local, resilient economies by serving co-housing communities, worker co-ops, small farms, and so on. And the reason I'm so optimistic that they'll do this is that there are so many unemployed lawyers right now. And uh, in the US, we expect that by the year 2020 alone, there'll be an additional 227,000 unemployed lawyers. And there's already a lot. So what, what, should, they do? what should they be doing with their time? Um, creating local sustainable communities. And so I also think that's going to change legal education. It's going to mean uh, that we're going to be teaching lawyers in new ways, teaching them new skills. Nobody learns what a cooperative is in law school, but they should. OK, at least not my law school. And the other thing that I think will happen is that lawyers will actually love their work and be happy, because if you think about it, you're probably much happier if the work that you're doing all day long is creating the world that you know that you could actually live in and that your kids could actually live in. You don't have that cognitive dissonance of knowing you're destroying the whole world while making a lot of money. So I think lawyers will be happy. I'm happy. I'm, 
So, um, so hopefully that gives us all a lot of hope that we're about to create these things. We're all going to create these things. Lawyers are going to help us create these things, and we're going to all benefit from them. So that's the next economy. And also, another way I like to put it, this is again David Bollier, is we're about to become protagonists in our own lives. We're all going to be so actively involved in creating this. It's not like we're just waiting for the economy to crash down around us or hoping it will spring back up again. We're actually creating it. We are becoming it. And uh, it's going to be great. So that's the end of my presentation. That's my book if you want it. And that's a discount code because it's far too expensive. Um, and those are some resources that we put online. And now hopefully we can have a conversation.